To start off with, we're going to be going through the decision of the Mexican government to move from cash-based payments to electronic payments, and really to look uh, at the, both the intent of the government as well as what a lot of the repercussions are. So first of all, I'd like to start off with two key takeaways. The first one is that the momentum behind the Mexican government's desire to make all G2P payments electronic is really motivated by two different things. One, you have the Department of Treasury that's interested in really going in and doing a basic cost-saving program. They want to make electronic payments in order to really start to shave off the administrative costs that are burdening down the government. However, you find that some of the other entities within Mexican government, such as the depend and uh, pardon my Spanish, it's horrible, but dependencias, as well as the Ministry of Finance, are looking at this in a completely different way. They see it as a means to further financial inclusion, to bring those individuals at the base of the pyramid into the financial mainstream to provide them with bank accounts, to provide them with cards, to provide them with all sorts of assets that then will bring them into the electronic economy. Now, the second key takeaway is that this is really difficult. So the harmonizing of the government-to-person uh, delivery channels really requires the reorganizing of almost everything in terms of how the various uh, elements of Mexican government interact with each other, the sort of information they hold, and how it is that they, um, they move, basically. Now, how have we gotten there? Let's start off with 2010 and two key decisions or two key actions that occurred. And then we're going to go back to 1997 and see what motivated all of this. So first off, this last December, all the various government entities were directed uh, by the Office of the President to develop a work plan to meet this 2012 goal, to transfer all their, uh, all their payments and as well all the intake of money that they had away from cash and to the electronic sphere. Now, in July, you had the Treasury develop a series of agreements with all the other government agencies to funnel all payments through one unique uh, bank account that Treasury holds, which really gives them the power of the purse over, uh, over all of government and a means to really start to see where all this money is going, to start to see if there's any sort of redundancies that can be addressed. But What's happening in 2010 is very inextricably linked to what started off in 1997. And in 1997, the Mexican government was coming off a series of financial difficulties. Um, you had uh, some very serious economic trouble that brewed up in the 1990s in Mexico that really started to push the government to reconceptualize its operations in a new light. So at first, the idea was simply to enable taxes to be taken in via the electronic channel to make it easier for those individuals that already had bank accounts um, to you know, start getting in direct transfers and you know, very typical payments, I'd say, for a lot of individuals within this room. Now, there are two elements that then started to transform the uh, situation, the development of two elements. The first is the development of a real-time gross settlement system. The second, in 2003, is the development of an in-house uh, information system. Now, this in-house information system is interesting because for the first time, you found that the government of Mexico was starting to collate all the data on those individuals that were receiving payments, on those individuals that, uh, or those companies that were paying into the system, and putting it all in one place. Previous, this didn't exist. Now, with these two elements, you started to lay the groundwork for the idea of the dependencies um, to not only automate the intake of all their money, but also to move towards dispersing the money electronically. Now, Benchico, which is, or Bencico, sorry, I have a horrible Portuguese accent as well, so I'm <laughs> in double trouble with all of this. Um, did something important at this point in time. They started to create standards, and they started to really look at how the e-economy in Mexico could be developed via regulatory action. So this first was the creation of a standard for bank transfers. The second, and perhaps even more important for the idea of financial inclusion, was taken in 2008, when Bencico uh, basically created no-fee bank accounts. 
And what this allowed for was the provision of bank accounts to the poorest of the individuals within uh, the country, bringing those individuals that previously could not afford to you know, make the payments on, um, on the fees associated with normal bank accounts into the system. And then finally, in 2009, up to the present day, you have the ministries of finance and public administration really jumping on the bandwagon here. And you see increasingly uh, a lot of different government agencies that have been pulled, kicking and screaming, into this entire process. By 2009, you see them voluntarily jumping in, seeing a real opportunity here. And these two agencies see cost savings as the real opportunity, which links back to the entire Treasury Department. Their goals at the very beginning, as I said, were a reduction in administrative expenses, an increase in transparency, and opening up the system to really look at it, to try to streamline it. Now, that wasn't what the finance ministry saw. The finance ministry is looking at this move towards electronic payments as potentially a way to really uh, to bring in a whole host of base of the pyramid uh, families that otherwise would never be able to access a bank account, that otherwise would never be able to receive an electronic transfer, that otherwise you know, really had no access to the electronic economy that was then really proliferating in Mexico. They saw this as a way to really reach out to them and bring them in. Now, the dependencias became the mechanism for this, especially one um, one program named Oportunidades. And Oportunidades is one of the largest government-to-person programs, conditional cash transfer programs operating in the world. And the interesting element about it is that Oportunidades is fa fantastically efficient as it is. You know, 97 cents out of uh, every dollar that goes into the uh, program, or every uh, peso that goes into the program, no dollars would go in, uh, is disseminated directly to the um, to the beneficiaries. So they didn't actually need to do this really to streamline their operations, but they say the opportunity as Treasury started championing this program to really jump on the bandwagon. Now, at the point that they started off, all the various uh, government to person payments in Mexico, they weren't really standardized. You had a lot of them involving a number of partners, whether they be bank partners or just uh, partners on the ground to hand out the cash. They weren't the same across all the various programs. So you had a lot of redundancy that then existed. You had a mix of cash and direct payments, with cash really being the dominant, um, the dominant point to be put out, which raised some serious questions, as Ahmed is going to go into later on, about the cost of just physically transporting cash all over the place. And each had their own specific account at a different bank, which actually was incredibly redundant and incredibly expensive. And then finally, each of those different accounts had different fees, which started to skim even more off the top. Now, Oportunidades, the program that I was talking about, really had two types of payments that were going out. The first was direct deposit. The second, as you can see on the slide behind me, is cash. And direct deposit was really only available to those individuals that lived in urban areas that already had access to a bank account which really was not a lot of the client base, the beneficiary base that Oportunidades was going after. So by and large, if you're uh, a poor family in rural Mexico, you're going to have to travel a long distance to a cash dissemination point to get this cash on a bi-monthly basis, which raises huge opportunity costs. Now, Oportunidades saw a different vision in terms of how to bandwagon with this movement to the electronic in a different way. First. What do they want to do? They want to move all payments to direct deposit. Now, right now, as you can see, these are the big uh, three uh, social programs in Mexico. As I said, Oportunidades is overwhelmingly in cash. Procampo and PAL, they're much better in terms of direct deposit, but still you know, not optimal. So in order to do direct deposit, you have to assure one primary thing, that there's something to deposit into. You need to create some sort of account that holds all these funds, with the added benefit that as these funds go into a bank account, some of it gets saved. So the intention by Oportunidades is to convert 
all their activities, all their payments into these bank accounts that will then be created with a bank called Bansefi. So you can see the uptake in uh, Procampo over just three years. And there's a very real possibility that if the infrastructure is put into rural Mexico, that you can end up with a very similar thing with Apertinidades. The problem is that the infrastructure does not exist in rural Mexico. But what does exist is a series of community-based stores uh, called De Consa. Now, these, and a lot of you will be familiar with the concept of an agent system, both from this morning's talk as well as uh, probably more generally, these will become the agent systems, the dissemination points for, um, for all the money coming out of Apertinidades. And here you can see the movement uh, towards cards for all these organizations. Now, unfortunately, there are a series of challenges. So how is it that you get cash to these small and rural communities? This is something that's still being worked out. Similarly, how do you ensure that there's liquidity at each one of these small community stores? If you have everybody coming in to try and get their cash out on a given day, very quickly you're going to run out. And very quickly, if uh, De Conce isn't able to pay out to those people that need it, it loses all legitimacy in the eyes of the population. The other problem is that a lot of these stores do not have the sort of electronic infrastructure to be able to ensure this. So this is something that the Mexican government has been uh, struggling with, to make sure that all these stores are wired. And then as well, this relates back to the entire liquidity question, how can you start to create an electronic ecosystem? How can you make it so those individuals are then spending their, uh, their opportunidades pesos at the Decanza stores, keeping the money in the system? Which, of course, this is kind of the, uh, the largest question uh, out there. How is it that you can build an agent network large enough before 2012 to be able to draw everybody in and make this work? Of course, there are also implementation challenges. So you, you have uh, a serious financial squeeze that's going on with the Mexican government right now. You have across the board uh, personnel downsizes. And that's made it much more difficult to really run, well, really to scale up this program, really to put the manpower necessary to make this work uh, in that service. As well, in Mexico, you have a series of labor laws that are fantastic for labor, not so fantastic for innovation such as this. Basically, if, labor, if a laborer wishes to receive money via uh, cash, they have to. And so how is it that you can go completely to electronic payments while keeping the spirit of these laws in place? Three is pacifying the banks. If you have one bank that's all of a sudden getting five million consumers, the other banks are going to start to get slightly irked. As well, they're losing a large, uh, a large series of accounts that are linked to the other dependencies. And so you have to really do a lot of outreach, bring them into the fold, make them understand what it is that's in it for them. And then finally, negotiating with all these government agencies was also a huge concern. So how is it that you can be sure that all the... Uh, all the beneficiaries will receive this money. A lot of the government social agencies really weren't sure that this could work. So convincing them that this new vision really was not just a possibility, but was really an opportunity has been one of the key challenges that the Mexican government has faced. Now finally, I'm going to leave you with two questions. And then I'm going to invite Ahmed up, and we're going to uh, converse about them. The first is that Electronic government to person transfers are appealing for different reasons. Now, what lessons can we learn to really fully engage the stakeholders in the future? In the Mexico example, the driving force was the Treasury Department. And their interest within that was simply in ensuring cost savings. Now, that might have been the initial impulse. But at the end, you have a transformative system that's evolving in Mexico that really brings uh, electronic payments to every area of the country. How is it that uh, you can really bring all the stakeholders and, for lack of a better word, herd cats and make sure that all of them are ending up at uh, the same place? And then finally, 
Given the divergent goals of these various stakeholders, how is it that you can declare success? How is it that you can identify a, uh, a cost-benefit analysis that really fully takes into account everything that's happened? So with that, I'd actually like to invite Ahmed up, and we can get on with an interesting conversation.